Hey everyone, this is Jaxie, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the History Roundtable. So today we are with This Is Barris, and we're going to talk some history. I'm really excited. This is a brand new podcast, and what I want to do with this is have history talks and history buffs and historians be able to come together in a more informal setting and just talk about what makes us passionate about history. So this is Barris. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Jack. So it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, also an honor to be your first guest. Uh, I hope I can uh, hold up to those expectations. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, as, as will be seen, it's probably not a high bar to clear, but I am honored that you're honored before I really open my mouth. So I guess first things first, how did you get into history? What kind of brought you to making videos on YouTube about it? Um, I mean, in all honesty, is I don't have any historical background. I'm actually in finance and economics. And I think the fact that I studied history so little in high school, um, I've actually, I think the last history class I had, and this uh, doesn't paint a good light on my channel at all, but I think it was um, maybe 14 years old, when I was 14 years old. So it's, it's almost eight years ago. Uh, and I think I just miss out a lot and uh, over time, I've come to like my country more and more, and I just wanted to discover more of the country, of its history and all. I see as the channel as a good way to not only share that, but this is to history. That's awesome. So what about your history classes didn't grab you? How come it took you kind of coming around to history on your own? Like, how was it taught that it didn't make you interested in French history in the first place? So first... Um, I think I was really lucky because I, I haven't actually gone to a French school, even though I was born and raised in France. Um, I actually went to an English school, which is the only reason why I speak uh, somewhat good English. So, you know, a lot of the history was American and English history. Uh, I'm half American, so I was somewhat interested by the American history, but the English, to be honest, I didn't really care about. Uh, but it's also, I felt like um, there was a strong emphasis on remembering dates and remembering people and you know to me uh that's not really the most interesting part of history uh i mean of course there's the crucial people but when you put such a focus on remembering stuff instead of remembering explaining the situations explaining how it you know it led to such events the reasons behind things like that i think that's more interesting than what day did this and this happened and so that i think is a big reason that put me off from history Oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, for those who don't know, I teach at a middle school level, and I tell my students honestly that the dates don't really matter to me because I'm frank with them, and I think to myself, what is a kid going to remember in 10 years? And they might remember the name of someone important, but they're not going to remember a specific year. They're going to remember, hopefully, why something was important. Oh, we need to know about the French-Indian War because after that, Britain put more eyes on the U.S. or the colonies at the time and wanted to tax them more to recuperate the cost. That's what matters. They, if they don't remember that it ended in 1763, they can still know why it mattered. But the problem is that uh, I'm sure a lot of prof ac profs actually think that, but... In the end, you have um, exams and curriculums, and if they ask this and that in it, you know, there's not much you can do. So I feel now that it's more of a passion than obligation. I can read the, um, you know, read the interesting books, uh, follow some great channels on YouTube like yours, which, you know, you, you learn about these uh, important background facts rather than just focusing on these key dates as we as we've been going on. So. So out of your videos, one really stands out. How did you arrive at crepes and talking about, is it candle moss, if I pronounce it not like the most American person ever? What was the inspiration for that? Because for that, you had a lot of like French Revolution and like Gaelic identity and then crepes. So I just want to know, how did you get to that? Because it ended up being a real winner of a video for anyone who hasn't seen it. Yeah, it's, um, I actually didn't know until I started that you call it candle mass. In French, we just call it la chandeleur. And I've, it's all, you know, about good timing because on the 2nd of February is when we celebrate it. And, and also because um, I've always wanted to make my channel to be a center of not just history, but um, 
gastronomy, uh, linguistic. There's a few couple of uh, language related videos. Uh, I have some that I've planned to, um, uh, you know, just culture and history. So, of course, I focused a lot on the history part because it's the easiest to do when you're not actually in France. I think it was more like good timing because it was just before the holiday and there's an interesting historical part to it. And it's just a huge part of uh, French culture, actually. I think it's a, it's a pretty big holiday. And, you know, I think everyone in France pretty much make crepes on that day. So, like, it's it's nice to do the, the serious topics and all, but it's also, I think, good sometimes to just be a bit more lighthearted and, and just look at these little quirks. A lot of people enjoy t- together and that just makes life more. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. And I think it actually goes to what you said earlier about... History to a lot of people isn't just dates, but it's like generals and politicians and philosophers. And, you know, for a regular person, a holiday or a style of cooking is going to affect their daily life in a much more tangible way that they're going to see more than who is the king or the president or the prime minister at the time in a lot of cases. Like, if I'm a regular person, I'm probably looking forward to that next holiday or my next breakfast, and I'm not going to be looking at what ideological constructs created my form of government. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. I think... I think um history especially for those who have interest in it but they dig too further i think there's a huge focus on very important character especially especially generals i think uh, the whole internet community have a a sort of obsession with this uh, caesar or napoleon um, romal or whatever trio Mm -hmm. Uh, but also you know just obsession with battles and uh and things like that. And I think in the grand scheme of things, these are have a rather minor impact. And it's, uh, you know, if you really think about it, there's some key less sexy, uh, in quotation mark, I, I guess my economics is coming out, but macro, like, mm-hmm. how is the economy? How is the level of food? Um, you know, like, why is China so much populated? Because rice has a higher glycemic I- uh, index than, um, than wheat or corn or, you know, things like that. And but those are sort of things that you know, like it doesn't really interest people because it's not a um, it's not a general having a great battle. But I think in the grand scheme of things, culture, infrastructure, economy, um, holidays, things like that have a much bigger impact on the course of history than any single battle could. And it's interesting because. You know, in academic history, and for viewers who don't know, I'm going back, I'm about to finish my master's, hopefully this uh, semester, they're actually, history is now swinging back that way, and there's a lot of focus on bottom-up history. When Mm -hmm. I took a class on the bourgeoisie and, like, middle-class culture and economics and lifestyle, reading about the history Mm -hmm. of France, like one of the key moments in French history, and I had no idea that this would be such a big thing, was the changing of the streets of Paris under Napoleon III, that they had this very old style Mm -hmm. medieval city with these narrow walkways. And in order to open the city up and basically reduce the lower income housing and put more middle class and upper housing and make the city look more modern. They just bulldozed it and they assumed state control. Mm -hmm. And that was hugely impactful. And that's like city planning. Uh, No, no, it's pretty impressive. And actually the reason why he did that was to to avoid barricades. Uh, The reason why the revolutions was successful is the streets were narrow, so it was easy to barricade and defend. And that's why, in fact, you go to Marseille, you go to Lyon, other big towns. I mean, Marseille was a huge proponent of the French Revolution. That's where National Hemphim comes from, La Marseillaise. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you go to Marseille and you find streets that are exactly like Paris. And it's basically um, Napoleon III uh, telling uh, Haussmann, I don't know if you know Haussmann buildings, is every building in Paris. Mm-hmm. Um, telling them, you know, recreate these new streets, give a new look to Paris, make and make big, wide roads so people can barricade them as easily. Oh, yeah, you're right, because uh, the revolutions were 1848, and then I think the, wasn't it 1853, give or two, we were just talking about dates slipping, but wasn't it in the 1850s that he started that project? So, yeah, that makes sense. I can't, 
I, I wouldn't be able to tell you, but yeah, I mean, uh, not, I think a lot of people just kind of assume that there was one French rev one French Revolution and then it was Republic. But yeah, I mean, there was like rent French Republic, French revolutions probably all along the 19th century. Uh, Les Miserables was set in the 1830s, for example. Mm -hmm. I, I think we kind of said that it really didn't matter. But yeah, tons of people who were displaced. And in some way, it was a big, like, it's nice today. Paris is beautiful. But you also, I feel like you kind of ignore the fact that millions of people had, came, not millions, but hundreds of thousands had to be displaced um, to build this new housing and all. And uh, I feel that's the sort of things you kind of ignore too. Yeah, but for like, you know, we were saying for a regular person, you know, the Franco-Prussian War, unless they're actually caught up in the fighting or they have someone who is off in the military or it affects their rations, that might seem more distant mm. to them than like, oh, I just lost my house because they're widening the streets and now I have to live on a different end of town and it's harder to get to work. No, I, I definitely agree. And I think I think the problem is um, past. It's hard for us to emphasize with them, you know, because in the end, a lot of time they're not even have names. Their quote is at numbers and something like that. Like, you know, the, the amount of French male that died during the Russian uh, invasion for us, it's just a number, but you kind of, and it's hard to forget that they're, it's hard to remember that they're, you know, exactly like us, you know, in the end, it's, it's still a tragedy. I guess, I guess my point is focus on these great people and the great action they do. And so you end up kind of um, minimizing the impact of these, of the, the general people, but also kind of not, yeah, dehumanizing them. And it makes it hard to empathize. And so it makes it easier to tolerate things like Caesar invading Gaul because he did it in cool tactics when he killed one million Gauls and enslaved a million other, which together makes a third of the population then, you know? Uh, but because it's just a million people and it was 2000 years ago, um, you know, it's hard to empathize. <laughs> and I, I totally agree. And it's interesting that you bring that up because I was just watching the uh, World War II week by week history channel and they had a really really chilling quote from hitler and as he was talking about his programs even early on and you know i'm going to try not to get into the myth of the clean wehrmacht here but early on talking about his programs to displace and dispossess the poles and set up lebensraum and stuff he basically pointed out that you have your Caesars and your Alexander the Greats and your Genghis Khans. And in their time, these men were butchers. And a lot of people either died as a direct result of their policies or their wars. Sometimes, like you say, with Caesar or I don't know about Alexander as much, but uh, Genghis Khan, like straight up genocides, like depopulation of entire towns or regions or countries. But then they forged Definitely. these new empires. They set in these new you know, state apparatus, and they're like, okay, well, you know, Alexander the Great, I'm teaching that in my seventh grade class now, and what are we studying with him? We studied, he won a lot of battles, and he spread Hellenism. And that's what, you know, you mentioned state exams, like, the state of Michigan in the U.S. wants kids to know that Alexander the Great spread Hellenism. They want Julius Caesar, like, what the kids need to know about him is that he was charismatic, he got people on his side, and he was one of the first big steps to toppling the Republic and moving into the Roman Empire. Genghis Khan spread culture and made the Silk Road stable. Like, that's the part that they want to know. And so it was real chilling to see that Hitler quote saying, yeah, I'm killing a lot of people and doing awful stuff, but he thought history would look fondly upon him. Because he thought, it would be like that. And now, well, it's easy enough for us to say, well, obviously he's awful. Like those other generals and they'd done some horrible things. And nowadays it's just kind of, oh, that's the price of empire. That's the price of statehood. Can arguably you could say, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think he was, <laughs> but um, I mean, it was, a, it was pretty awful, but yeah, I mean, it's just kind of um, considering how much people love and praise people like Caesar or even Napoleon today. And I'm going to get a lot of hate from from the French here, and I mm -hmm. and I do uh, uh, praise him for his ability to defend the Republic and things like that, despite its weak situation and things like that. Is there's no denying also that he had a huge impact on uh, on France and a huge negative impact. I mean, 
Um, I don't know if you've seen my other video about um, the woman that got guillotined during um, the Second World War uh, for being for having an abortion. But basically, it was a, a lot of it is how French demographics had a huge um, impact following the 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 Napoleon War as such that at, um, at the beginning of World War One there was a 20 million difference between Germany and France, you know, in terms of population. And so, yeah, I mean, there's no denial of that. And, and the fact that today he's praised so much, the fact that people are today like Caesar and a lot of their crimes are forgotten, it makes you wonder, you know, in 2000 years, how are people going to look back at more recent controversial characters like, like Hitler? I don't think anyone would ever praise him to that level, but it's kind of shameful that we easily forget the impact these people had because they had a certain greatness. Like they created something great, like the Roman Empire or the French Empire. And yeah, I think it's just important to remember how it impacted people like us, basically. Oh, yeah, definitely. And that's that's why I, you know, did the uh, review slash almost takedown because I got a decent amount of hate for it of rise and fall of the third reich because you know william shire was there he is a primary source he up until 1941 i mean he was actually in germany in france reporting on these events as they happened but he just talks most of the sources he uses are these top-down sources and it's a really interesting play-by-play -play, but in his version it's like oh two leaders of states talk to each other and one came out on top and that's history and then it affected people and there's no journals there's no diaries there's there's nothing from regular people and even even books in the 70s like how i got into history a lot of it was in high school reading cornelius ryan and um was it stephen ambrose i think talking like different battles but Cornelius Ryan was really good at using like regular people's stories. He would do tons of interviews and diaries and like, you know, I make the joke in the review video, but he starts with a milkman. And at one point he talks about this rare exotic bird in the Berlin zoo that wouldn't eat because it couldn't get its type of food. Mm -hmm. And as a high schooler, like it kind of seems silly. And I asked myself, why am I reading this until I realized like, Oh, well, I'm still reading it. Like, somehow this is connected to me. I think as you were mentioning with the displacement for the Paris and all, it's just, it's just much more relatable. I mean, a big part of this is um, engine, but I feel like, for example, in Europe, a lot of people feel smug about American culture, for example, you know, as in rear to European culture. And um, because, you know, like we had the arts and we have these uh, great buildings and things like that. And, you know, while you might agree that, I agree with that, I think what I like about American culture to some extent is that I really felt like it was by the majority instead of, uh, you know, in France, it wasn't your common peasant that built Versailles. It wasn't your common peasant that built, that made uh, La Joconde and things like that. It was really, you know, like a very small minority that through oppressing a lot of people were able to create these these arguably beautiful things. But, you know, you have to also, appre you have to also appreciate the, you know, how uh, that affected the people behind it. You know, the, the million in debt France came to just to build a castle, uh, Versailles and things like that. And, but also the fact that, you know, it's not, it's not really French culture in the sense that it's a culture that, one percent of the french and so that's why i like things going back to candlemas i like i like it because it's you know it's a really french tradition i like the local regional french food because it's it's the gastronomy of the local people it's not a it's not something that was created by some chef for the king or something like that uh, if you know what i mean but i feel like uh, europeans mock and feel a bit superior to the americans uh in terms of culture but what i like about american culture is that it really feels well it's popular culture and i feel like it really belongs to the American instead of belonging to a certain 1%, you know? Yeah, Amer like, it's weird because we've always had income inequality and we've always had social classes, but at the same time, I'm trying not to use the word feudalism because, I don't know. Were, were you taught about feudalism as a kid? Because I was taught, like, this is an aside, I was always taught about feudalism and I'm supposed to teach feudalism, but then when I went back to school, apparently it's, like, not a thing. And we've all been lied to because I was about to say like, oh, America never had feudalism. And then I'm realizing like, 
I would get laughed at in my grad classes for even using the word. You know, it feels complicated because it, it just really feels like summarizing, you know, hundreds of years of history into one single, like a lot of people, for example, would say after the French Revolution, we no longer had feudalism. But to say you, to say that France was under feudalism just before the revolution and then comparing it to your textbook definition in the in like the eighth or ninth century, you know, it's a bit of a stretch too, in my opinion. But well, yeah, and I think oh. that's the argument, and it made sense to me. It was like like the document where the Latin is like about feudalism, and I'll look it up and put it up in the screen at some point. But it was from like, wasn't it from Lombardy in like one thousand or eleven hundred? And then somehow historians took one legal document, like you say, from one time and one place. And then we're going to decide to sum up like 700 plus years of European history over the better part of a continent using one document from one place. It's nuts. I haven't heard about that document. It looks pretty interesting. I mean, I don't know enough about feudalism to to comfortably talk about it, to be honest. I just know, um, especially following Henry, Henry IV in France, which was a leading figure in absolutism in France. I mean, the whole point of feudalism is having senior, like lords, which basically mm-hmm. have land and they, and they order. And, and the reason why, for example, Louis XIV built Versailles and castles like that was to bring the nobles into one place. So, you know, they, um, so he could rule the whole country himself because the nobles were happy and, you know, just having fun in the palace. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, could you call that feudalism? I, I think... You know, at that point, it's no longer feudalism. It's one supreme being. And so, yeah, I guess I, I definitely agree that it's kind of, you know, it's just too simple to simplify the, the history of a whole continent uh, for 800 years like that. Yeah, and that was, uh, I'll, I'll have the author at some point, but that was her argument is basically, yes, Europe was governed by systems of relationships between different social classes, and it was often taxes and you know, taxes and military contributions for protection or land or titles. But like Mm -hmm. you say, it played out in such different ways. And with so many different documents, we can't just trace it to one document in one place in one century. It it really depends also how you look at the definition of feudalism. If it's about having nobility owning lands and the peasants collect for them, then yeah, France had that sort of feudalism until the 18th century. Uh, because there were still the estates and and uh, the nobles and the clergy owned most of the land and the peasantry collected that land. But also, you know, they were the the nobles didn't have their own army anymore, for example, or you know, they weren't. It wasn't. It was. It was no longer the basically you collect you you raise my land you you farm my lands and give me a tax and exchange I will protect you from another lord that was yeah it was no longer a situation the environment in 18th even much earlier France century France and so you know it was much more centralized and I think it's uh can't summarize the 800 of history in one word so yeah you know a lot of everything we're talking about just goes back to how history is taught and you know we have to teach stuff like that I ran into recently you know, we use a textbook in my class and we were talking about the Battle of Marathon and I gave the numbers from the book and one of my students actually raised her hand and said, hey, did any of this happen? Are any of those numbers right? And I basically had to say, probably not. Like, we're trusting a guy named Herodotus and then some dudes who wrote later, some of whom weren't even Greek, they were Roman, and they might have got it from some sketchy places. And it was just, we launched into this big talk how a lot of sources come from generals and politicians, and of course they're going to tell the version where they are these heroes, and the battle was super on the edge, and then their own leadership, they were able to win with smaller numbers, or a president was able to navigate a really bad situation. And so, it just... It's interesting how much we are taught that basically is either not true, or you gloss over what history actually is and what historical methodology actually like, or methodology, excuse me, actually is. Basically, our only source for the Gallic War is Julius Caesar. You know, the 
the one guy who above everyone else had a huge incentive to pump up the numbers to you know basically make himself a great name and you know it's kind of I, I can't imagine how hard it is for historians to try to find out the true and that to see how much he inflated himself, uh, how much, um, you know, he garnished everything because he wanted to run for console and things like that. And uh, and, it, and it's kind of frustrating because you want to go to the truth and you just have to accept the fact that you're probably never going to be accurate because uh, everyone is biased. Um, there's only so many sources and, you know, especially for because uh, I talked a lot about the ga- the goals in the end, but, uh, you know, the goals, uh, they weren't allowed to write. It was only their druids that were allowed to write. And when they did, they wrote in Greek. So we don't have a lot of written accounts. And a lot of it, and a lot of the accounts was uh, based on Greeks and Romans, which who thought they were barbarians. And so, yeah, of course, you know, a lot of how we think about them today is a, is a reflection of how their enemies thought about them back then. So yeah, and, and I think it's a bit unfair because it's history on them. And but you know, a lot of uh, these accounts are pretty unfair. <laughs> Just to show, it's really interesting how it interesting how it um, distorts your perception. I think for a lot of time I get really confused by how history was in Europe, and I don't know how to explain this, but basically, for example, a lot of the a lot of the paintings, a lot of the depiction of our Frank of the Frankish kings, are from much later, and they're very anachronistic, mm-hmm. and that makes it really complicated to kind of see and understand how they were, because you always see them as as a 14th century king. You know, you look at a painting of of uh, Clovis, and he will look like um, François Ier, or he'll look like yeah, he'll look like François Ier, and so you can you kind of uh, see them in a much more modern than they really were and you know it's just hard to know and when you mix and it's kind of a weird confliction because you mix the idea of the common barbarian the common uh, uh, german barbarian that took over after the roman empire burned but then you have these images of them looking like 14th century 13th century kings and so um, it's just really hard to have a, a good image of how these people really were and how they look because there's just so little contemporary con- temporary sources and the contemporary sources are from the Romans or from uh, the Greeks. And that's, I think you bring up a really good point too, that any historian, even historians who try, they are going to reflect something of their own society on the history they do. Like if you have someone in, you know, the middle ages or the Renaissance writing a history or doing a painting or examining something from I'm going to say the early Middle Ages. I'm not going to use the other term that doesn't exist uh, that I was unfortunately taught too young. But that kind of the creeps dark in. Dark Ages? Yeah. I was like, I want to call it Dark Ages, but I yeah. know better. But that's that's the same thing in the Dark Ages. That comes from later. That's the Renaissance. And the word Gothic comes from later. And now, like, it's hard to teach about the Goths as an actual, you know, people who actually navigated through history. Because now when you say gothic, people are either going to think about, like, the 1990s, early 2000s, and quote-unquote emo kids, or they're going to think about, you know, a certain style of architecture from, like, the late 13 and early 1400s. They're not going to think about this tribe and this moving nation. Or they're going to depict them with uh, schools with spike, um, you know, having skulls and big fur, and they wear spiked helmets and you know and they just as dirty barbarians but if you look at it for example the uh, the reason why the franks were so successful is because they've been uh, uh they've been uh, fighting the romans for for centuries and they learned a lot of their fighting techniques you know they were really good fighters they weren't the oh just throw them and be enraged and you'll scare them away type that we often depict them and so i think you know we yeah, it's just uh, a lot of our image of them are pretty unfair, in my opinion. It's just not true. Well, and isn't the, the long-haired, naked berserker, like, I would have to go back through. Because I know Caesar's not the only writer, but most of those were Roman writers talking about how the Gauls or the Franks fought, if I'm correct. I, I made a, a whole, actually, episode on that, too. And, you know, a lot of Roman, um, well, the, the helmet... Came mm-hmm. from the Gallic helmet um, with the ears, and actually, that's um, 
believe why, for example, you know, in Asterix, you have they all have wings mm-hmm. all the time on their helmets, which is pretty silly if you think about it. But uh, people actually think it's because of the ear flops that you know looks like wings if you put them on the side. Code de mail. Oh, I can't. I'm, I'm losing my English. <laughs> <laughs> the mail. The mail. Okay. Mail. The chain mail is believed to be come from the. Um, I think it was Agrippa, which was the 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 Gallic, uh, the Celtic um, goddess of horse. Uh, horse riding, which mm. the the Roman horse riders took um, adopted to, you know, it's just um, yeah. If you actually look into it, it's pretty shocking to be honest. When you realize how biased and how kind of silly and uh, and uh, degrading and your image, the image you had of them, and when you, you know you discover they were pretty refined, they were pretty sophisticated. You know, I mean, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's People who lived uh, next to the Romans for centuries, um, they even sacked them at one point. There's no reason why they would be so backwards either. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, um, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have the desire or the or the resources to look into it that much. And, you know, I just hope to help uh, eliminate some of these myths with my videos. Mm-hmm. And I, I think you're doing an excellent job because... I see a lot of parallels in that, that you're allowing one people, in this case the Romans, to write history for another, in this case the Gauls and the Franks and all the other people on their borders. And it's weird because I was about to say it's the victors writing it, but I see a lot of parallels in World War II where it, it wasn't the victors at all. And that's always if I want to be a jerk and people say, you know, history is written by the victors. Not at all in World War II and... Honestly, in the American Civil War, not at all. Those are both cases where the the vanquished people have had quite the influence on the historiography. And I do a lot of that in the Second World War, like the, the trope with the Soviets. And, you know, you can play mm-hmm. some of the old uh, combat mission games and the Soviets have an option called Human Wave. Or you watch Enemy at the Gates, and I'm not going to rehash my whole video, but, you know, man with the rifle, shoot, man without the rifle, all that. There are, all those quotes come from, like, German generals. One of them is quoted in Alan Clark's Barbarossa. It was a German who said, you know, Germany is an elephant being swarmed by ants, and the ants will eventually bring the elephant down. Like, that comes from them, and the German generals, in their effort to, A, not get arrested or killed in the Nuremberg trials, but B, to preserve their legacy... And both militarily and kind of in an anti-Nazi like conscience type of way, it was von Manstein who said that the Soviet commissars forced the men to do human waves, and he actually used the phrase "Asiatic um, lack of appreciation for life." And you you see this idea of Asiatic hordes come out, but then it gets quoted in media, and it's like you're using literal propaganda from a foreman german general it it amazes me that people aren't critical and a lot of you know there's videos out there on youtube and people arguing on reddit and forums oh the germans would have won if they just went from moscow like says who Guderian? of course he says that because moscow was his idea and he doesn't want to take the blame for part of the loss and also it's also a reflection of the political environment i mean after World War II and the whole Cold War, it kind of shows you the level of the Cold War when people are more willing to trust Germans than, uh, you know, they feel more relatable to Germans than they do to Russians, which is now the new next big enemy. So, mm-hmm. you know, you end up believing the accounts of Germans because I'm pretty sure they didn't even ask the, the Russians if they actually did it, you know? And so, yeah, it just shows, I think it was um, a reflection of the political environment after world war ii and during the cold war and unfortunately um it kind of just became a a common meme you know mm-hmm. a common trope that people repeat and sort of common thing that is really hard to debunk and you have to you know it's part of a, even the national cur- curriculum like for example in france a lot of the the cartoonish depiction of the goals can be found in textbooks and i think at that point oh wow like, i don't think any youtube video is going to do anything to change that <laughs> Mm-hmm. And it's just, um, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of personal desire or even 
that is possibly wrong. And I feel like a lot of people could be wrong. So, you know, you're not going to research something and, and see if it's right or not. If it doesn't even come to, to you, if it just feels right and it doesn't even come to you, that it could be wrong. So, yeah, I think it's a large active effort to try to debunk all these myths. It's going to be a huge effort. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And even then, like, I, I don't know if lay people understand, even debunking a myth, it doesn't mean we will ultimately be right. It means we are more correct with the evidence that we currently have. I don't think people understand, like, I, I don't know your opinion on this, but I'm yeah. not sure in a lot of situations there will ever be an objective truth because there's are always so many people who experience historical events in so many different ways and a historian has to look at all this evidence and the best they will do is make an argument and it might be a compelling argument and it might be better than arguments that came before but I don't know what are your thoughts is there an objective truth can we ever just find out what happened exactly how it happened I don't think so to be honest I think it's impossible first just resource-wise, there's just not enough information unless we were some kind of sentient being at the very moment and looking from outside. Uh, there's no other way to know how an objectively an event occurred. And again, the fact that this is perspectives of people writing it with their own biases for their own countries. No, I, I think it's pretty impossible. And uh, you know, I think that's the kind of the job of a historian is it's it's more of detective work to find the objective truth within that. But in the end, yeah, I mean, even the historians themselves have a big bias. I mean, a lot of people enjoy doing alternative history, for example, but I think that's a really dangerous exercise because it's one of the best places to put your biases. Like, you know, if you're going to ask something like what would have happened if Cuba didn't, um, if there wasn't the Cuban revolution, well, someone who's a, uh, pro-revolution is going to have a much different outcome than someone who wasn't, even though you're starting from the same place. And and for me, uh, it's an extreme example, but you can have the same thing in history is that two historians with different viewpoints with the same evidence are going to come to very to massively different conclusions. And the people reading that with different viewpoints are going to come to their own massively different conclusions. So no, I don't think there is any objective truth. I just think then you have to be willing like to discover how met. Like if if you still think Caesar's accounts of the Gallic Wars are a reliable source, if you're just able to think I understand how I, I should see it with a another eye because he might have been influenced by his desire to become consul uh you know i think that's a good step forward you don't even have to change your viewpoint you just have to be willing to accept the fact that there's objectivity in it and so subjective even yourself mm -hmm. well that's a, a good example i always use for that even though it's much more modern is i don't know have you ever seen the t television show mash Rings a bell, but I wouldn't be able to tell you what it is. Though. Okay, yeah, it's a you know super famous American show about a mobile army surgical hospital unit in the Korean War. So it all takes place mm -hmm. during the Korean War on TV. Well, the show was done. It was like late seventies, early eighties. So even though all the names are about Korea and everything in the show mm -hmm. says Korea, it's not about Korea. It's about the Vietnam War. And all of the political points that this TV show makes, all the themes, all the morals and the messages are actually reflections about the Vietnam War. And it just shows that you can have a historical topic, but, you know, they are making a point about an event that was much closer to when they were actually filming it and doing it. Yeah, and I think I understand the desire for artistic making political commentary. The problem is that a lot of time, this is going to be one of the only interaction a person is going to have with that history. You know, the, he's going mm -hmm. to base his whole knowledge of that history. Okay, hopefully not. If he's American, uh, you know, hopefully he'll know more about the Korean War from uh, high school and all. But, you know, I feel like a lot of people, uh, a lot of their history on Mel Gibson movies, for example, <laughs> which is a terrible thing to do. <laughs> No, so, but you're, you're right. You know, like, and I, but, uh, like Braveheart, I man, so so much about that movie or The Patriot. Like, but a lot of Americans, like you know, Britain is the bad guy, and so of course they would do all these horrible things and be as awful as possible. And there are people, yeah, like with World War II, Enemy at the Gates. That oh, I've seen a movie. That's how it is. Okay, now I'm an expert. 
Like, I got this. I mean, I mean yeah. I mean, uh, even just the fact that um, in Braveheart, you people who wear kilts, you know, mm-hmm. like, um, even though I think they, they weren't common or they weren't a thing until the 18th century, I'm not sure. Yeah, it was uh, much later. I, I don't know my kilt history, but, <laughs> um, you know, it's just... Uh, and it, it seems like, oh, it doesn't matter, but it's just an obvious example to just show all the things uh, and how, you know, it really warps people's history and it really uh, this sort of misunderstanding. And, you know, I think I do think it's a bad thing. And while I understand the desire to be entertaining and to want to make a good movie, when you have a look, a, a good example of this is, uh, have you seen 1492? Uh, with a with a French actor, um, oh, I forgot his name, Gérard Depardieu, um, about Christopher Columbus. Don't believe I might have watched a review on it years ago, but I don't know if I've seen the actual film. Okay. Well, that is an extreme example of bad history movie, but it's pretty awful. It's like it, it starts with benign things, saying, for example, Christopher Columbus w- uh, wanted to go to America to prove that the Earth was round, even though we knew. Um, since the Greek times, and it goes to things, you know, as far as saying that Christopher Colum- uh, C- that Columbus was against what they had the crimes done against the indigenous people and things like that, even though he was put in prison uh, for six weeks by the own uh, by the queen. So you know, it's just, and I feel like you know people see that and they actually that's their conclusion. You know, Christopher Columbus was a good guy, or you know, like he he wasn't so bad and things like that. And I think that's bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, that's, and you mentioned earlier that 14 was eight years ago for you. I'm a little older. I'm 30. But when I was in fifth grade, we learned that version. We learned that every, everyone in Europe thought that everyone in the whole world thought the world was flat. And here's this visionary who's going to prove it wasn't. And then it's like I get into high school and college and they go, no, Ptolemy, like done. Like we've known this. People knew for almost 2,000 years. I discovered like what Christopher Columbus or more like his crew did and the round earthing embarrassingly late too. Actually, what I love about YouTube is I really feel like my knowledge of history and my ability to learn about very obscure things in Creole. I mean, you know, I kind of realize how limited and I know we have there's only so much time you have, but it just kind of baffles you how much more history there is to learn. Uh, when you realize all the videos there is on YouTube and, and of places I've never even think of, thought about. I mean, the whole history of China, the whole history of the Mesopotamia area, you know, and just it might sound silly, but it just kind of baffles me by how crazy, how huge history is mm-hmm. <laughs> and how much more there is to know. And also like how without sounding kind of condescending or anything well, the average person and myself would will know in the end because there's just it's huge and, and there's just so many different regions and 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 then if you in extra of that you have to add the fact that a lot of it might be misconceptions or myths uh you know it, it really gets it gets daunting <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah and, and some of that's just logistics like you know, the honest truth for for a seventh grade student in Michigan in the United States, they get 45 minutes a day for 185 days to try to learn everything about, you know, human evolution from like Australopithecus all the way through like the Middle Ages for all the major continents. And just the, the reality is we have to cherry pick. And we do this like, we're going to leap around and look at a couple different civilizations, but there's inherent bias in that. That, oh, if we're looking at India, why do we study these dynasties, but not these ones? Like, who says Mohenjo-Daro is that much more important than another part of the Harapan civilization? But that's, you know, you get 45 minutes a day, 185 days, and that's one year. Then kids will come back to it in 10th grade. And then depending on your major, they might not even look at history in college. And I also feel like there's a huge, and I understand why. I mean, it, it has a much higher impact. There's a, there's a huge bias towards more recent history, which, you know, makes sense because it has a much higher impact on people's day-to-day life. But, you know, for example, prehistory I learned when I was in first grade, maybe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just the closer, basically the, 
the older it is, the younger you were. And what can you learn in, about prehistory in the, in the, in first grade, even though it is a fascinating topic, but you know, uh, the Romans, I learned maybe in the third grade and, and World War II, you know, it was like in the final years, of course, it makes sense, but it's also kind of a shame because uh, you end up learning very basic stuff about very old periods and you know, like the whole Bronze Age, which is a fascinating period, but it just seems so uh, obscure to most people. I mean, I, I'm still baffled whenever I, I'm reminded to the fact that the Great Pyramids are as old for Cleopatra as Cleopatra is for us, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, and I think most people would be baffled by that too. I was often, actually, that's another great point. I feel, I feel like in the past, we tend to bundle periods together. Mm-hmm. You know, like here in a hundred years, no one would compare us today to people in, 19, in uh, 1918, 1990. But it's so easy when you go to say, oh, there are 17th century people or even like 2000 BC, you just bundle them with uh, Cleopatra. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is but it's two thousand years of history that you just put together, and um, yeah, I think it's it kind of like we did a huge hoop back to the to our the beginning of our conversation. It's a bit of how it's so hard to empathize and to relate to so far in the past, even though they're more or less the same as us. Yeah, no, that there is definitely some of that, and you know, even as someone who teaches it, like there's only so much I can do with the time and resources I have. But it, it definitely, even Greece, like, within the same couple weeks span, I don't even, we really didn't even have time for, like, the Minoans and the Mycenaean. So, it's just kind of, here's Athens and Sparta, then we skip forward to the Peloponnesian War, and then, oh, the Persian Wars were in between, and then Alexander the Great. Mm-hmm. But it's like, you know, really, if you're looking at the foundations of Greece and their political, you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of years but you're just shoving like the classical and the ancient like you're shoving all that together and you're just saying this is greece you got three weeks because then we got to go to rome yeah i mean ask anyone what is this common depiction of a of a roman centurion you know and it's uh gonna be a 15th a.d um soldier you know with the with the big chest plate and the the feather not the feathers but the red thing but mm-hmm. i think the roman empire survived but you know it was hundreds of years of history and you know they changed it's just so easy to bundle it together and it's just and i feel like you actually have to do an active effort to remember these are distinct periods and it's not fair to stereotype and it's not fair to just yeah to just bundle them together like that all right, so thanks, everyone. Uh, this has been Jaxie with the Round Table History Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the first episode. Once again, I want to thank my wonderful guest. This is Barris. Do you have anything to say before we take off and send this inaugural episode out into the world? I uh, just wanted to thank you for having me, and uh, I hope you enjoy the episode. And I hope to come back in the future. All right, sounds good. And if anyone is interested in seeing more from Barris, I will link his video in the or his uh, channel. Rather, in the description, it's This is Barris. He does videos every two weeks and an awesome sampling of French language, French French history, and French culture. So, thanks again, everyone, and stay excited about history.